Please give it up for Adina! Thanks so much, Terrence. What a treat to have a herald like you on board. Hey, everybody. Um, so as it says up there, I'm going to talk to you today about SSO, or single sign-on. How are we for feedback? Nobody's ears being blown out? We're good? All right, cool. So yeah, um, and I promise you that it will be accessible if you're a beginner. I will define my terms. And if you're an expert, I'll probably give you nightmares. It is family friendly, there will be no swears. The kids will be probably mostly falling asleep, but uh, yeah. So let's jump in. Um, I like to tell you what I'm gonna tell you before I, so you know what to expect. So what I'm gonna talk about mainly is my perspective, which is I work for a big company and we need to purchase surfaces and stuff like that from uh, other vendors. So I need to make sure that the vendor's single sign-on works for my business. I'm not going to cover the nitty gritty technical details of almost anything, to be honest, but specifically setting up your identity provider and making sure that all of your, your things are configured properly. That's not, that's not the side I'm going into because my IT have very clever people working on that already at my company and I didn't work too hard on that side. And I think I'll cover a little bit, if you're coming from the perspective of the vendor, how we can work well together. Because the same questions that uh, I need to ask vendors are ones that's really useful for vendors to maybe proactively tell me about and uh, maybe ask me exactly what I'm trying to do before implementing it. So, I've told you what I'm going to talk about, so why? Why am I here? I'm here because I've learned through hard experience that if you try to implement single sign-on and you do it wrong, you can feel safe. You, you've checked off your little compliance box, SSO is implemented, but you've actually maybe even made the situation worse because you've just hidden all the things that you've broken underneath the hood of this very shiny checkbox. But I don't want to leave you in the depressing place. Questions are your superpower in this and probably any other technical installation or other that you're going to build. Um, if you are willing to sit there and ask the, in quotes, stupid questions, which in my opinion there are none, they're mean questions and they're mean answers, but they're no stupid questions. If you ask those questions, you will make sure that you actually understand what's going on and that you and your vendor are really aligned and what you have implemented is actually gonna work. And I think it's a, it's a superpower for your career, for your project, and for fun. You learn new things. That's what we're all here for, right? Okay, so I said it's a beginner talk, so we're about three minutes in, hopefully, and uh, I'm finally defining what is single sign-on and why does your company want it. So, of course, I went to Wikipedia. Thank you, Wikipedia contributors. Single sign-on is an authentication scheme that allows a user to log in with a single ID to any of several related yet independent software systems. Okay, that's a mouthful for people who are really beginners. What it means is that in my context, I want, to people, I want my colleagues to sign into my company and not to have to sign in again before they access all the rest of the company's stuff, wherever it's stored, on whatever kind of cloudy situation we're using at my company. And why do we need it? So, this is the past, or maybe the present, if you listen to McFly. Um, <laughs> but you had a company and all your stuff is in your building. Um, you're running your own infrastructure. Uh, if in the past you might even have had it physically all in one building and you actually had to go plug in a cable, it wasn't necessarily internet connected, you control the door, you control everything, so you're happy. But we don't live in that world anymore, for the most part, unless again, you're living in McFly's lovely world. Talk to him, he, I make no guarantees that he actually approves this. But <laughs> some of your stuff is still fully under your control. You're running it. You may even have it air-gapped, you have the door keys, etc. But, but what's this cloud situation here, and, and who's controlling these ladders? This is where single sign co sign in comes in. So, up here in the cloud, we have all our vendor stuff, and I could call it software as a service, or platform as a service, or I don't know, like IS, or I don't even know. It doesn't really matter in this context, it's your company's information and, and stuff up there in the cloud. And we have these ladders that allow your users, or anybody maybe, to come up the ladder and get access to your stuff. And what single sign-on does is it lets you put your company's login process between your users down here and the cloud up there. Hopefully that makes sense. And it sounds really great. So we have the dream here, which is, it should centralize managing users. So for example, if uh, my colleague leaves the company tomorrow, 
then I can kick them out of my system and they won't be able to access anything else. And that's really helpful because if I have 17 services, I mean, fortunately this isn't my job, but I would forget one of them. I'd forget to kick them out and that would cause problems. And I think we've all heard about situations where people didn't get locked out when they should. So that's gonna be great. It should make life easier for my colleagues. Of course, my company has a wonderful password manager that everybody uses, and we all have very strong and unique passwords for all of our platforms, and we're not reusing our Windows passwords for everything that we use for work. In this case, they don't have to worry about that anymore, right? They only have their one sign-in with me, it can be my password, and then they get into everything, me being my company, right? It also allows you to enforce some more consistent security standards. So if everybody has to go through your login, you can implement the kind of multi-factor authentication that makes sense for that account. You can do things like GOIP blocking. So you say you don't want people to sign in from North Korea, for example. Or you don't want people to be able to sign in from uh, the United States and then 15 minutes later from London. Things like that are now in your hands because you can actually control the login procedure. But I guess there's a little bit of foreshadowing here by me calling it the dream and using this nice house of cards. Because I don't really think it works that way all the time. Not all the time. Because <laughs> the thing is that if we go back to the Wikipedia definition, SSO protocols don't guarantee any of that. They're just a way for my company's identity provider, so the thing that lets me log in, to tell the vendor, I think that that person is Bob. That's all they are. So, going back to why am I giving this talk, this little optimistic purple blob was me until recently. Um, I was very idealistic. I heard about SSO, I was like, that's awesome. I think it's a good thing. My IT people say it's a good thing. Oh hey, my vendors say they offer it. Great, we're just gonna turn it on and everything's gonna be fine. <laughs> yeah, it's the beginning of a horror movie, isn't it? <laughs> So this is me now, the more skeptical blue blob here, um, and I've realized that before I do a project of any sort, but especially one that involves letting people access my company's information, I need to figure out what I need first. Before I start talking to anybody, what is it I'm trying to accomplish? Then I need to figure out what my vendor can do, like how do they understand this problem and what do they think the solution is? And once I think that I've understood both of those, the most important thing is, I need to ask weird questions. And I think we're hackers, and a lot of us are really good at that, looking at a system and figuring out, okay, what's the edge case here? Where might something get broken? And that's where you can like, really help these kinds of projects out, because asking those questions is what's gonna save you. So, for the rest of the talk, what I'm gonna do is actually go through these section by section and uh, talk about how I implement them and why I think they're important. You have a question. I think we actually have questions at the Q&A tent afterwards. We have a half hour slots. They want to make sure you can get as much content into your brain as possible. But I will be at the Q&A tent next to info. Yes, it's true. I do want your questions, but all right. So I'm going to start by uh, talking about what I actually needed in my context. And maybe you'll have similar use cases. Maybe it'll be different, but yeah. So I have found repeatedly that before I try to do something, it's really helpful to know what I'm trying to do so I can know I'm going in the right direction and I know when I've gotten there. I don't know if you've had this experience of not doing that and starting just going off and mad madly in all directions. For me, it doesn't work so well. <laughs> Though it can be a fun art project. But if you're trying to implement security stuff at work, not recommended. Okay, so that's where we're gonna start right now. I came up with two needs for my, my company, at least in this simplified presentation sense. The first one is I want to force people to sign in through my company. Kind of makes sense if you have the beginner's understanding of SSO like I did, you kind of think that that is exactly what SSO does on the tin without asking questions, but you know, we've disabused ourselves of optimistic notions. <laughs> so what does this mean? Um, I want to make sure that my company's identity provider gets to approve every sign into my company's stuff. And only after you've gone through my company will you get access to the content. All right, need number two. Users can only access their own stuff. Again, seems very obvious and kind of ridiculous to write down. 
let's start from the basics here. So what I mean in this case is that we have Bob's account there. And um, when I say that this is Bob, Bob can only access their little doghouse. Um, and nobody else can access Bob's little doghouse either. And if there are exceptions, and we'll get to those, because they are not ridiculous, actually. Some of them make sense. If there are exceptions, they have to be clear. That's the important part. All right, so we've got, I think, a basic understanding of what my needs are. So let's talk about what my vendor can do and why my vendor might have different ideas than I do, and that that's actually like not even them doing a bad job. Sometimes it is, but often it's just they're coming from a different perspective. So. When a vendor's building a product, they are probably not building SSO first. They're not, like, you're not purchasing their service because of the, the single sign-on. They're building a cool new internet thing, or maybe like an awesome old thing. You're buying their service, not their single sign-on. They only develop single sign-on later, probably, thanks to some of their big customers coming in and saying, oh, my annoying IT department. They said that like, we can't have this contract anymore unless you like, give us this thing, so let's build the checkbox, right? When they finally do build the single sign-on side of their product, they probably have different ideas about it than you do. So let's talk about some examples. This is one, you've probably seen these screens all over the place, right? It's really common for vendors to say, I want to allow single sign-on because it's convenient. Like I said, you don't have to have 17 different passwords but the vendor might not want to force it. So you need to understand, is that how your vendor is working or not? They might not care about usernames matching. So in a business context, I really, really care if it was Bob who modified that document and sent it out or CEO Alice, right? So it is important for me to know who the identity is that matches up to that user account. Um, yeah. it's. From a DEI perspective, from a, from a humanity perspective, it is really important to let people pick their names, I think. Um, and this is something that I've gone to bat for at work. But at work, I certainly do need to, again, be able to match those people up and make sure that I know who I'm talking to on the vendor system just as well as I do inside of my own internal infrastructure. But yeah, again, there are contexts where a service might reasonably not care for a whole lot of reasons. So you just need to ask. Beyond that, they might let users change their own information. Okay, look, I have special characters in my last name, a hyphen and an apostrophe. Um, that last name was also generated when my parents got married and they mashed their names together. Names change. Names can cause weird problems. Letting people change their names, again, very important. But I don't want Bob to be able to change their name to Alice and then to Charlie every single day of the week. That would be bad for me because I would not know who was editing what and doing, causing what kind of malarkey on our system. So again, it makes sense, but I really need to understand what the situation is. Do I have control over it? Can I watch what's happening? Can I make sure that people aren't changing their names in ways I don't like? Um, so what I said up at the, at the my needs part was that I want Bob to be able to only access Bob's account, and only Bob to be able to access accounts. So I don't want shared accounts. But shared accounts are often really useful. I mean, I have shared email addresses that I use at work, for example. So your vendor might have these, and the question is, how exactly do they work? Can any account be a shared account? How does the process work to link people up? How can I watch that and make sure only the people I want are linked to that account, etc.? So again, they have different, really good reasons that they might have different rules than I do. I just, again, really need to understand what those differences are and make sure that I can watch out for them. Oh, and the fun one. So I've implemented single sign-on, but there might still be some places where basic authentication or just a username and password might still be available. So my little skateboarding dog can come in the back entrance if I don't know about it. <laughs> Again, this isn't even necessarily necessarily a bad thing. You know, if you have a robot user, there are some cases where your risk profile is such that, okay, it's fine for this account to be able to use basic auth. But the fact that you have this back door, does that is that available for everybody? Do I get to toggle it on and off? Do I get to log who's using it? 
Do I get to look at, you know, make sure that I enforce minimum password standards for these <laughs> basic auth accounts? I need to understand all of these exceptions because that becomes a big problem if Bob has used the same password in setting up the account as Bob did on the cool dog website, which then got breached. So. All right, so now we think we know what we need and what the vendor can do. So we have these vendor accounts, which are these nice little chickens on the one side, and I have my company identities, the, the purple broccolis on the other side. And I need to translate between chickens and broccolis. Um, credit to uh, Microsoft for their wonderful clip art. <laughs> And I live in Germany, I did not grow up in Germany, I love learning languages, and one thing I have learned about translations is that you should not assume that you know what's going on. You have to ask questions, or you're gonna end up in a world of trouble. So, fortunately enough for me, that was point number three, ask weird questions, <laughs> because communication is hard and people make mistakes. So, in this section, I'm going to go over each one of my needs that I described before um, and talk about some questions that you might want to ask to make sure that you understand exactly what the situation is and whether your vendor is going to meet your needs. Um, and then I'll share some exciting failure scenarios because I promised some nightmares up at the beginning. Um, and those nightmare scenarios are, they might exist in your system and if you know about them, you can mitigate them, and if you don't, you might have a very bad day. So, let's dive in. Need number one, users must sign in through my company. So, only signed in employees are allowed. Okay, so what does this mean in detail? I want everybody who is accessing my business's inf information to only use my company's sign-in. So they can't like use some other company's sign-in to get access to my data. And I also want to force my users to always go through SSO. So I don't want to have any robot backdoors or anything like that, in this simplified example at least. <laughs> um, I don't want to have any exceptions. Um, and again, if there are exceptions, I need to know about them. So what are some weird questions I might ask about only using my company's sign-in? So this one seems wild. Is there a way that somebody signing to, let's say, my competitor's single sign-on, which is also set up at the vendor, would allow somebody to get into my org's account? It sounds completely wild, but let's do a thought experiment. What about those lawyers you brought in last month to do some due diligence? Did you want to set them up with full accounts on your system? You probably, that's gonna be a pain. It's gonna be a pain for them. You're gonna send them a laptop. I mean, it might actually make sense for you to say, this other company is also okay for this amount of time for these specific pieces of information. Um, and what about the consultants that we bring in for six months at a time? Are we gonna give them full accounts as well? Or should we set up some, some reciprocal trust relationship there? You might have permitting bodies. You might want to let your cousin in to do some work. I don't know. There are lots of cases where this actually could make sense for you. Which means, again, the vendor might have set it up to work. Even if you have none of those scenarios that are applicable to you, the vendor probably has some customers who need that. So, yeah. The key here, again, is can you see if it's happening? Can you turn it off if one of your competitors is maybe trying to get in? You know, can you make sure that, that, that you can see that happening or that you can explicitly allow list those companies that you want to have access to your stuff? And if you can't, can you at least check that there, whenever an exception pops up, you get notified so you can kick them out immediately? So what's the failure case? So let's say you didn't ask these questions and it turns out that if you just turn SSO on for your organization's accounts, anybody else who has the following things can still get in. Any signed in identity in any other SSO setup connected to the vendor. So you have your competitor and uh, they have an account A and that account uh, can sign in to their, their um, single sign on setup and also can be connected to the vendor, and that, and that competitor is connected to the vendor. And then, again, Bob used the same password on cool dog site, and uh, that password got breached, so this person has the username and password for Bob. So they have an identity that's connected to SSO, so they check the box of single sign-on has been used to access the vendor system, and then they have the username and password. 
then they can link the two accounts up and maybe you don't even find out because there's no notification. Again, this was a minimum viable product that the vendor built. <laughs> this is not how it should work. In my opinion, there should at least be some warning bells, but uh, it is possible and that's why you ask some questions, right? So again, yeah, then the especially fun case here is if, if there is no warning. So part B of users must sign in through my company was I want to force the use of SSO. So for my stuff, you, it's never going to be enough to just have a username and password. So they told you that they've turned, that I've turned on SSO because I have that control, that's great. Um, so there's no way for a user to sign into the home page without going through my company's sign in or identity provider first, right? But if you think a little bit carefully, that was a very specific statement I just made. So let's talk about some questions you can ask. Will you ever fail away from my sign-in provider, from my identity provider? Again, seems like a wild question, but what happens if something goes completely bonkers with your identity provider? You probably need somebody to be able to get in and fix that connection. So, and you may actually, like if your AD gets owned and you still have some stuff that needs to get done, this can actually be a nice backup strategy. If you have a way to get in that you know about <laughs> and is secure enough for your purposes, this can actually be a plus. But yeah, it's really important to ask these questions so you know whether there is a failover. Um, let's see here. Question number two. Yeah, what access is enforced for API users? Again, do you just have that nice little backdoor that's available for everybody? that goes through basic auth that actually just provides access to everything. Let's, let's know what that is first, so at least I can make sure that I uh, enforce some password resets on a regular basis or something stupid like that, so I can try and keep people out or monitor it again. So, here's my failure case. I have chosen to use a plate of spaghetti for, uh, to illustrate my failure cases so that uh, it illustrates that you can't tell where my uh, company's sign-in starts and the vendor account ends. So, in this case, uh, my vendor did two things that I'm really glad about. They've enforced SSO in the user interface. So if you go to the front page of the vendor site and you try and get access to my stuff, you have to go through my sign-in. Great. And they've given me control over our little skateboarding dogs. Uh, the API users are under my control. I can say how they're going to authenticate. But, I'm in the way here. Their own app can't use SSO. Uh, yeah, I mean, this happens. <laughs> Which means that there's actually a backdoor for every single user to get access to all of the content using basic auth if it, they pretend to be their own app. So yeah, um, fictional, fictional cases, right? No, one, no one's encountered anything this crazy in real life. <laughs> Oh, and by the way, the only way to monitor this is by looking at the logs. Are those logs a premium service? <laughs> All right, so let's go on to need number two. Uh, users can only access their own stuff. So what does this mean? I want to make sure that Bob can only access Bob's account, the little dog house here. Um, and I don't want any shared accounts. So I don't want anyone else to be able to get into Bob's account. And, oops. That wasn't a point that appears, and any exceptions are clear. So, weird questions about Bob only being able to access Bob's vendor account. If Bob has the username and password on the vendor side for Alice's account, can he access Alice's account too? Seems wild, but it could happen. <laughs> I mean, just to explain that a little bit more, if the checkbox is simply person has a valid identity in your identity provider and then arrives into the vendor's system, they've checked off that has signed in through SSO and then just needs the user name and password to get into Alice's vendor account. At least here you have a couple of factors, but it doesn't feel that great to me. So this next one is a little bit less beginnery. Does attribute mapping rely on non-user editable fields? So the only way that the above one works is if I'm not checking that literally anything about Bob's account on my company's side matches anything on the vendor side. And that matching is called attribute ma mapping. Um, and maybe your vendor actually has some attribute mapping, but it's important to ask, is it checking that like say Bob's name matches Bob's name in the vendor side? 
is that name editable by the user? Can they just change it to Alice tomorrow? Um, and then, I mean, again, people are implementing minimum viable products. Uh, when you're under the pressures of capitalism, things happen, right? And I would encourage you as, as hackers, if you have any time available, even if you get answers that you like to all of these above questions, try changing literally everything that you can as a user on your account and seeing if you can still sign in. Test if there's some mapping going on under the hood that you don't expect. And if you suddenly can't sign in, get an, another admin to make a new account with the same information your old one had and see if you magically get into that without any kind of challenge or linking. Just theoretically. <laughs> so failure case, what can happen if you, if you don't ask these questions and the vendor isn't clear? Okay, so yeah, like I said, attribute mapping wasn't in the MVP. I think this is actually super common, though it's kind of scary. But in the end, it's not a big deal really if they do it in a reasonable way. So you can make a lookup table that says, here's something unmutable about the identity on this company side, and I'm gonna match it to something on the identity provider. But they used usernames in this case, which are editable by the user. Okay, maybe this isn't clear to you, probably a lot of you are already figuring out how you can attack with this. Uh, yeah, so attack unlocked. So let's say I used to work for my competitor and I know how they like to name their users in the vendor system. So I found out that they hired a new CISO and they're gonna start in a week. So I'm gonna make an account that has that name and link one of my identities. So Cal Competitor is the account I made and I'm gonna link my Adina identity to that Cal Competitor. Now I can sign in, everything's great. I'm gonna change the username to test, test, test. Now Cal Competitor is available. So my competitor makes that account and I can get in and no one will know. If things are that badly set up, this can happen. This is why it's important to test. <laughs> All right, how much time? Okay. Um, weird questions about I don't want shared accounts. Okay. So again, like I said, shared accounts can make a lot of sense. But I need to make sure that I understand whether they're turned on and if they say they're not are they really sure? Are there any exceptions? And push them on that. Because the failure case here is, you didn't ask, but they do exist. And all it takes is, again, Bob signs into my company, Bob enters Alice's vendor username and password, and now Alice's account can be accessed by Bob and Alice. And again, the real failure case here is you don't know, there's no notification, and you just can't tell. So if you know that it's happening, the least you can do is actually run regular logs. <laughs> and hopefully that's not a premium service. Or you get somebody higher up in your company to yell at the vendor because if they've set it up this way, they need to be providing these logs for free. So what's the point of the talk? Just about there, so. <laughs> I asked some folks uh, at a, a village that will not be named if I should do this talk if they thought it was interesting. And they were like, Oh, misconfiguration, how boring can you get? Just do it right. There are a million ways to fail. You just do it right. Like, why, why even talk about this stuff? Okay, there were some other kind people who encouraged me as well. <laughs> and I've spent a lot of time in hackerspaces and I'm still here, so I guess I didn't listen. Because I disagree. Because people don't know, and people in technical roles don't know how easy it is to mess this stuff up. You kind of have to fall on your face a few times before you realize it. Or ask those questions before you fall on your face. So what I really hope you come out with this after this talk is that you are empowered to ask these questions and mess around a little bit. Um, and empower your colleagues and your friends and your hackerspace sysadmins to ask these questions as well. Um, I think it will really save your bacon <laughs> and uh, find you some really interesting things and maybe you can make a talk next time. So there we go.